me turn it off over to uh, Sudan, who is our photonics chapter chair. Uh, thank you, Darren. Um, I'm the Ringarajan Sudarsanan. I'm the chapter chair for, uh, for the photonic chapter chair for IEEE Bonaventure section. Um, it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, uh, to Joshi. Um, I've known him for the last uh, three years and, and personally, but uh, I've seen his papers for many years and I interacted with him in the past. Um, C is the CEO and the Chief Innovation Officer of SAS Micro Inc, uh, which he founded in 2012. Uh, he has published more than 100 papers in international publication in the imaging sensor research, and he has more than 50 inventions, and he has six active US patents. Um, he has received many um, awards, including prestigious R&D award, and his team also received the Wall Street Journal Award for Most Innovative Semiconductor Product of the Year. Um, he graduated from UC Berkeley. Uh, in UC Berkeley, you did uh, design a particle detector ICs used for at Sohn for the discovery of the Higgs boson. Uh, am I correct, uh, Atul, that this uh, invention got the Nobel Prize? In this one, um, actually, Peter Higgs got the Nobel Prize for you know. Uh, you know, coming up with the Higgs boson in 2013 after in 2012, uh, the uh, Higgs boson was actually seen using the uh, using two detectors simultaneously. One was the one that we worked on at Berkeley called the Atlas detector at Large Hadron Collider in CERN. Yeah. So, uh, and he also, the, after his academic research, he joined Rockwell uh, International Imaging Group. Uh, now Teledyne Imaging, um, where he developed many commercial CMO imaging systems on a chip and also large format uh, sensors and cameras used in aerospace. Um, currently, he's developing novel sensor and systems for industrial, airborne, and space imaging. Uh, today, he's going to talk about evolution of the scientific image sensor ICs, past, present, and future. Uh, thank you, Atul, for uh, giving this presentation. Uh, please go ahead. Thank you, Susan, for the introduction and inviting me here. So uh, my talk delves into what imaging ICs are, image sensor ICs are, and how they have evolved over time. So um, the first part is to be able to understand or define what these are, and they're not like defined the same way by everybody. Uh, imaging is, uh, you know, pretty omnipresent um, around us, you know, in today's world, unless we're living in a cave, we would be using cameras almost all the time. Uh, so, um, as consumers, um, if not as engineers, you are quite familiar with many specifications of image sensors. Here are two examples of type of image sensors that we have worked in the past that are, you know, um, for consumer applications. On the left, is a image sensor that was developed for a JVC camera, the camera shown um, at the bottom, uh, which you know has been used to take all the different images, you know, uh, several movies that have been recorded by this camera. So this was the first uh, broadcast quality 4K image sensor, as JVC would like to claim. Uh, broadcast quality means it's very high dynamic range, much more than what you'd get out of your cell phone camera. Uh, typically 13 to 14 bit type of dynamic range rather than uh, 10 bit dynamic range that, you know, most consumer cell phone type of cameras at that time, you know, were. On the other side, on the right side, we're showing another consumer uh, development where some quantum dot technology was deposited over a readout integrated circuit. Again, for consumer application, this company that we developed the uh, image sensor technology for, you know, took some videos with regular light as well as structured light over here for 3D depth sensing, like uh, what Microsoft Connect does in, in terms of a gaming console. And um, this technology eventually was, you know, led to this company being bought by Apple. So these, these are, you know, uh, some of the consumer or prosumer oriented type of image sensors, you know, that are out there today. And most of us are 
familiar with these, but this is not what I'm here to talk about. I'm, uh, I'm going to talk more about the what's not commercially available, and what's not typically the kind of sensor that you see in your pocket in the form of a cell phone or uh, the other digital cameras or video conferencing cameras like the one we're using over here. So getting into that and trying to understand what are the different classification of sensors? You know, they can be classified on the band, the spectral band that you're imaging. So over here, um, we have the spectra from the left, which is the longest wavelength or lowest energy to the right, where we have shorter wavelength or higher energy. And typical image sensor applications lie between this region in the middle where the lowest energy that's typically imaged is uh, in form of a two-dimensional large array is a uh, long wave infrared uh, energy, which is um, in the eight to 12 or sometimes 14 micron wavelength band uh, through visible, that is typically 400 to 700 nanometers into UV, some deep UV and, and, and getting into X-rays. So those are, you know, your, um, typical imaging bands in which uh, large format images are built. But very few of these are, if you look at the breadth of imaging, are, you know, uh, commercial type of imagers. Many of them are scientific. They're not numerous in terms of the number of units sold, but there are a wide variety of scientific you know, imaging applications that require a lot of innovation in these image sensors. And often what happens is that, you know, the scientific imagers develop some new technology and if it is feasible, it's commercialized and it's brought into the mainstream imaging uh, sensors that we have eventually in our pocket. So um, here are some example images on the long wave side and the medium wave infrared side, you know, their ICs developed that, you know, take images like the ones shown over here. We have uh, this image from outside our office in Thousand Oaks. The one below is Westlake Village, you know, just people walking some dogs uh, shown in long wave band. Um, in the middle over here, we have a sensor chip that was developed for uh, short wave infrared imaging. And here's the Griffith Park uh, taken in short wave infrared. And on the right side is uh, this, this sensor that was developed for uh, commercial visible imaging and a visible image, you know, shown over here. So most of the imagers that are, you know, in the visible UV and X-ray domain are based on silicon technology. But because silicon band gap is such that it cuts off at 1.1 micron uh, wavelength um, at room temperature, if you want to uh, image longer wavelength that has lower energy than, than the band gap, you cannot have a photon kick an electron from your uh, valence to conduction band because the photon doesn't have enough energy to cross the silicon band gap. So you don't get any sensitivity in, uh, in the infrared and far infrared bands with silicon. So you need to have some exotic materials uh, that, you know, the scientific community uses and get into that shortly. So one way to um, look at what scientific imaging is, is to look at the bands being imaged. And if it's a standard plain vanilla visible 400 to 700 nanometer, 450 to 700 nanometer band, and mostly that's commercial sensing. But beyond that, the, most of the bands have a wide variety of uh, scientific applications. The other way to look at it is um, the CMOS production capacity around the world in image sensors, mostly dedicated towards making monolithic low cost sensors. But the scientific imagers end up being mostly hybrid devices where the detector material uh, is developed in a different material system or on a different vapor at least than the uh, readout um, IC. And we'll get into that, you know, why that is so. Then there are imagers that, you know, stare like, you know, our typical commercial sensors where each pixel takes an image 
of a part of the scene simultaneously. But there are uh, many other type of imagers that are scanning type that scan a scene. And there are some commercial scanning you know, sensors like the technology used in fax machines or, or in scanners, flatbed scanners. But most of these scanning sensors you know, end, end up being um, of scientific nature. And we'll get into that, you know, some differences there. So this vapor that is developed by our team is showing a scanning imager. It's a very long imager. You can see this is an eight inch vapor, which is a very typical you know, commercial vapor, eight inch and 12 inch are, you know, commercial sizes. Uh, this image sensor, you know, is occupying more than half of the width of the vapor. It's over 100 millimeters long. This is a space push room scanner, you know, used um, in satellites where it scans over the scene as, as the satellites moving, you know, over, over the earth and develops the image by stitching all those images together. So, uh, so I mean, you could have scanning versus staring imagers, monolithic versus you know non-monolithic, based on the functionality. You can differentiate imagers. So there are a lot of ways to classify these imagers. So let's look into the material systems uh, over here. So um, here we have um, the different wave bands shown on the x-axis, and on the y-axis we have detectivity which is a form of sensitivity. These two curves over here are background limited imager performance, which is showing if the imager was ideal, if it detected every photon that was incident on the pixel of the imager, then you would achieve in a certain level of uh, performance. And at cryogenic temperatures, the performance is higher than at room temperature because um, of Thermal excitation at room temperature kicks certain amount of electrons into the conduction band, so you get some dark current in the absence of any signal. And that dark current has dark noise associated with it, which causes these uh, sensors to uh, basically be limited in performance by the dark current short noise. And there's a Poisson distribution of dark current noise, which looks like short noise, where the noise is noise itself, the, the RMS noise is proportional to, a or the variance of noise actually is proportional, directly proportional to or equal to the uh, mean signal. So, um, so at room temperature, you know, you have some backward limited performance, but different materials come close or approach this performance, but don't quite get there because of various inefficiencies. The scientific community is always looking for the best material that gets closest to this trend line or or the or the limitation uh, that we have physically. So, uh, a material is chosen based on the wave band or application that gets closest to the blip performance. And more often than not, that material is not silicon. And because it's not silicon. You need to build these imagers usually as a hybrid device, as shown over here at the bottom, where the detector material is built in one technology and the silicon readout, you know, often readouts in the silicon technology, is a different technology. And you connect the pixels between these two through either uh, micro bumps like indium bumps, or you do thermal compression bonding or some other type of bonding to connect the two materials together. So um, the typical scientific imager that I'll be talking about will be of hybrid form, where the detector material could be a wide variety of materials that can bond to the readout IC. But since we are here to talk about the integrated circuit part of the technology, we'll be talking about this ROIC or readout IC that is uh, developed for these kind of hybrid image sensors. So if you take a look at again some of the images taken by these kind of you know image sensors, they have wide variety of bands and the wide variety of applications from you know visible imaging, high performance visible or near infrared imaging for microscopy to imaging in thermal bands. So we'll talk about you know what kind of image sensors or ROICs are involved in these different kind of um, imaging modalities. So with that. Uh, introduction. Let's get into uh, first what 
is not a scientific image sensor, what are non-scientific image sensors like? So if you look at your typical commercial visible image sensor, this technology started to become prevalent in the early um, 2000s. When I joined Rockwell, I was hired as they were setting up a team to bring cameras into cell phones. And you know, we in the early days used to wonder who wants to take a picture with a cell phone. But in that, that is history now. Uh, so these imagers, these early CMOS imagers being developed in late 90s were of front side illumination type where the light entered from the front side through micro lensing. It passed through the various dielectric stack or metal stack that we have in front eventually into the silicon material and it got sensed. Over time, there were hybrid devices with a detector that was in a different wafer than the uh, silicon readout integrated circuit. And these were explored for commercial applications, but they they found a uh, good home in uh, scientific imagers, but not for commercial because of the cost entailed at that time with these hybrid devices. The benefit of this was that light did not need to get through this dielectric stack on the CMOS technology that was meant for pretty much building digital chips. And one could optimize the detector material, but because of the cost, this did not take off. So that led to wafer scale backside illuminated devices where the wafers were thinned. And since they were back thinned, they, uh, now the light could enter from the back side of the vapor, there was, there was no metallization and micro lenses and color filters could be put on the back side and you get you got much higher sensitivity because you got almost 100% fill factor in this kind of a device. And you got you know, very little uh, reflection from the uh, interfaces between the dielectric stack, the silicon oxide and silicon nitrides that you have that had grown at a different time and also the metal layers that were from the front side. So the light came from the back side and that eventually took off and most of your mobile phone cameras are of this type these days in the backside illuminated. This also helped shrink the pixel size down to close to one micron and then eventually sub-micron pixel sizes. Currently the research work or the advanced technologies you know, have a half a micron to 0.6 micron uh, pixel size using the backside illumination process. But this process still relied on all the circuitry fitting within a pixel. And as pixels were being shrunk, it got harder and harder to fit all the readout circuitry within the pixel. So eventually, 3D IC stacking technology was developed. And this is now the most common form of a sensor that you would find in a cell phone where not only it's backside illuminated, but the first sensor layer is a fairly simple circuit, but it's stacked uh, with another wafer, uh, which you know has most of the complex compute in it. And there's a copper to copper uh, thermal compression bond between these two layers to connect these sensors. So the visible commercial imagers um, have you know gone from front side to back side to now 3D stacked ICs. So with that in mind, now let's look at what the, uh, in contrast, what the non-commercial or scientific community been doing with their image sensors. So for the scientific community, going to the next section, you know, looking at how the evolution has been, it started with developing charge couple devices initially in the early 80s or even late 70s. And then coupling these devices with exotic materials like mercury, cadmium, telluride kind of detectors that had a tunable band gap. So you could have a variety of uh, cutoffs, uh, material cutoffs bonded to the same you know, readout chip, which was based on this charge couple device technology. And to make uh, these CCDs, you know, um, more sensitive, 
the coupling had to be improved. So there were some input circuit types like direct injection that were embedded into these CCDs in the early days. Eventually, uh, that gave way to CMOS technology as CMOS was improving. And these chips were made larger and larger in the CMOS processes until by the year 2000, we had 1K by 1K or even 2K by 2K. So four megapixel sensors being developed in a hybrid form. These sensors were tried to be scaled to larger formats like 4K by 4K and 8K by 8K formats, but the yield was horrible in the early 2000s. So those sensors that were extremely large were used for some specialized government you know, satellite kind of programs that could afford a very exotic, very large format readout IC, but uh, they were not mainstream. So many of the customers decided to array these small chiplets into larger formats to build large focal plane arrays. And that became the area of research once the baseline imaging technology was established and we had moved from a technology that was, you know, had very high noise, very poor SNR to a technology which was getting close to blip limit. So the SNR was pretty good for most applications. So then the idea was to scale it up and make larger and larger focal plane arrays. But eventually the CMOS technology improved enough that these larger focal plane arrays again were embedded back into a single chip and very large format like 8K by 8K and even larger sensors were demonstrated in the mid 2010s. So that's been the progression, you know, trying to get the noise improved initially, then get the format larger, then eventually make arrays of large format to make even larger formats, and then coming back towards, you know, making monolithic large formats. And these monolithic large formats are also being arrayed into large array sensors in these days. So if you want to know more about this, uh, you could go and uh, check out the SPIE talk that I gave at Optics and Photonics that talks about the progression you know, of these sensors. Um, now, looking at this progression, the early uh, CCD devices were fairly simple, where uh, there was a detector that was bonded through a bump into the readout, and that formed the source of uh, Photo current, there was a gate that could be controlled that allowed this current to flow into an integration well. Um, and this photo gate then eventually was clocked using a charge couple device to read out um, and raster scan this uh, array of detectors, first in one dimension into a register and then horizontally through a horizontal register out, out of an output port. Now, once the baseline technology was established, as I was telling earlier, the SNR had to be improved. So we needed better injection efficiency and better matching of the readout circuits in terms of their input impedance with the detector impedance, as well as matching the um, readout circuit with the flux levels that were being dealt with. And for those reasons, variety of circuits were invented. Initially, uh, there were some direct interface circuits where the detector itself, as shown over here, was terminated with a resistive load. So the photo current was uh, basically skimmed using this resistor, and the difference current was flown into a trans impedance amplifier and amplified through this 1 over RF factor converted into uh, the voltage or, or the RF factor and converted into the voltage over here. So um, this kind of circuit initially, you know, uh, led to improvement compared to directly sensing the current, but eventually there were integrators put together, including a gate modulation, direct injection, buffer direct injection kind of integrators. And these circuits become complex, more complex with more and more tra transistors being fit into the pixel. So early 90s saw a lot of research into the type of input circuits that should be coupled 
together with the detector material. Beyond that, in the late 90s, these circuits were more or less established, and there were larger and larger arrays being built. There were some records that the Rockville Science Center in 1998, right here in Thousand Oaks, set a record of you know developing a 128 by 128 format Mercatel focal plane array based on a 60 micron pixel, which had multi-million well capacity, so it could hold a lot of electrons in the pixel, and had less than 1,000 electrons or so sub-1,000 electron read noise, which was a big deal in those days. At the same time, you know, a couple of years later, EG and G came with uh, their own 512 by 512 platinum silicide focal plane array with a new readout that was built on a 30 micron pixel pitch. And they defined um, the noise in form of noise equivalent difference in temperature NEDT, which was 90 millikelvin. So that's the smallest change in temperature in a scene you could see for a regular room temperature seen with F2 optics. So these were major advancements at that time. But over time, these images got better and uh, the noise kept, kept on coming down to single digit electrons eventually in these Hawaii type of arrays uh, readouts, which are used in many astronomical telescopes, including the James Webb Space Telescope that's going to be launched in a couple of weeks. Uh, three of the instruments over there, the, the near cam, the near spec, and five guidance sensor are using the Hawaii 2RG uh, focal plane array that we built um, at uh, Rockville Scientific, uh, which not only had now uh, in it a um, very low noise input circuit, but also um, had uh, shrunk the pixel size down to 18 microns increased the array size first to 1K by 1K and eventually 2K by 2K, but also put a guide mode in it, which basically shown with the circuit diagram on the right side. What this mode allows you to do in simple words is a picture in picture where you can have the whole array do a very long integration while you can selectively go and reset a set of pixels independent of that integration that's going on and integrate again and read out again at a fairly fast rate. And this is used to track guide stars, but it can be used for tracking various objects by creating virtual windows around those objects that are fast moving and tracking them while the whole scene's been in integrated at a fairly slow rate so you can build up a lot of signal and have great SNR over the entire background scene. So other advancement that eventually happened on these uh, readout ICs involved putting analog to digital converters in the IC so that you get digital data out. Microlensing, uh, you know, the focal plane arrays themselves so that you could reduce the detector capacitance so that eventually you could push the readout IC to have better read noise. Multiple windows that we talked about and high dynamic range imaging where you could have multiple snapshots taken by a pixel at different integration time, for example, or have dual gain in the pixel so that you can improve the dynamic range within the scene called the intra-scene dynamic range. So once these advanced pixels were established, then the CMOS technology scaling was used from 800 nanometer, like 0.8 micron to quarter micron technology, eventually to 180 nanometers, to improve the yield and keep on shrinking the pixels down. The latest, you know, Hawaii arrays, for example, have 10 micron pixels uh, that are being built by Teledyne uh, at, uh, in the Camarillo site. Um, so these H2RGs and H4RGs, they got bigger and more, um, the scientific type of image sensors became uh, more of, you know, standard in imaging. But making much larger image sensors was very difficult from a yield perspective, even by going to 180 nanometer technology, which was the best available at that time in terms of analog mixed signal you know, processes available in CMOS. So these had to be stacked into larger arrays and mosaics, as I was talking about earlier, to make larger and larger focal plane arrays. 
but these mosaics had some gaps, which were which was not ideal for imaging. So eventually, there were interposers made where you know these chiplets could be put on these interposers, and that helped shrink these gaps. So that was the technological advancement in terms of readout ICs, you know, getting into the mid 2000s. But there have been exponential increase in the type of readout IC circuit technologies you know, that have come about in the last decade or so. So some of the more recent advancements have been not only in exceeding the formats like the Raytheon, you know, 8K by 8K sensor being demonstrated in 2016, or uh, the Teledyne 4K by 4K 10 micron, 15 micron being uh, demonstrated, you know, uh, a decade earlier, and the noise getting down to five electrons, you know, uh, with visible detectors bonding bonded to these. But the advancements, you know, uh, were in many other areas. So we talked about the increase in the pixel format. Over here we have pixel format from the mid 70s when these image sensors started to pretty much now, you know, showing an exponential trend, except this data point being a little bit off the off the trend line over here. Uh, but as you know, the image sensor got larger and larger, people started asking, you know, is that all we want to do with these? We've got lower noise, we've got larger sensors, we're increasing well capacity. Or are there other parameters that we care about? So the last decade or so has started looking at various other parameters, you know, thinking about that size is not everything. Megapixels is not everything. Frame rate is not everything. There, there are other things that one should care about to eventually make these sensors more suitable towards the variety of applications, scientific applications that they're trying to address. So initially, you know, uh, there was more integration done on chip to avoid uh, noise coupling in off chip and to improve the bandwidth of readout by putting biasing, clocking, A to D conversion on chip. Eventually dynamic range, dynamic range was addressed by uh, having multiple gains uh, within the pixel. Then um, there were issues with operability. So to improve operability, there were some bad pixel deselect added into these pixels. And eventually, you know, the pixels started seeing some on-chip basic signal processing that is getting much more advanced in this current decade. And I think in the decades to come, there'll be a lot of focus on this on-chip processing. So in terms of noise and dynamic range uh, improvement, the uh, lower and lower noise readouts were invented for, um, you know, various backgrounds. And now we're getting into single photon detection with uh, SPAD type of devices, single photon avalanche detector devices. Uh, but at the same time, um, there were readouts uh, being uh, made uh, in more recent times that address the background limited imager performance for longer wavelength bands, where you may want to be able to integrate billions of electrons within a short period of time, within milliseconds or tens of milliseconds. So huge charge capacity improvements had to be done. Simply put, we could not fit a capacitor that size in these image sensors. So we'll see what kind of improvements allowed us to, you know, uh, be able to integrate billions of electrons in a pixel. Then another area of research has been to improve spatial noise. In the past, temporal noise was everything because you cannot get rid of temporal noise. Spatial noise, people said they could calibrate out eventually because you could take a dark frame in the system with a shutter or a black body, and then you could take actual scene and you could subtract an average dark frame from your signal to remove offsets. And if you have two different dark frames at two different illumination levels, then you could take out gain errors. So spatial noise could be removed, but as the technology became uh, higher and higher performance, the spatial noise started dominating the performance because the temporal noise was coming down and, and, and people did not like the artifacts that were there, the residual artifacts that were there even after uh, doing a non-uniformity correction. So there have been advances in improving the spatial noise. 
uh, there have been a lot of advances in improving the speed of uh, these uh, sensors, especially with now autonomous driving and uh, tracking kind of applications, uh, the latency from when a pixel sees an event to when it's read out has uh, been continuously improved to you know microsecond levels or sub microsecond levels. Then there have been system level improvements by embedding some companion chips ASICs into the uh, uh, image sensor uh, module. And the power metric, you know, has been a very important uh, driver to try to get down from tens of milliwatts per megapixel per second being read out to now much less than a milliwatt per megapixel per second read out while continuously improving the dynamic range of the of these sensors. So if you look at all these improvements, I like to break down the generation of these image sensors into five broad categories. The initial readouts were built on the CCD technologies, either doing a two-dimensional readout or doing time domain integration using, you know, 1D scanning using the CCDs. This technology saw great improvements in the early 80s, but it reached maturity before the 1990s. And as um, electronics engineers are, you know, always looking to uh, figure out, you know, what else they can do to uh, improve on the brick wall uh, that was being, you know, uh, faced with at that time, they started inventing more interesting circuits. And analog CMOS readout integrated circuits came about, like I was talking about earlier, with the direct injection and source follower type of readouts. And they saw a lot of advancements and improvements in the technology until early 2000s. They hit a brick wall with you know, what you could do with this technology. So late 90s, you know, saw a big push in making these ICs into digital readout circuits by putting on chip ADCs of the biasing and clocking being on chip, and you have serial programming interfaces to command and tweak any bias or reprogram the chip with a different clock pattern and uh, reprogram the A to D uh, digitization rates, for example. And that led to the third generation of re scientific readout IC technology. And that you know kept on improving over time. There's a lot of research in the early 2000s done in this area, eventually towards 2010, you know, that became saturated or matured in terms of its performance level. And at that time, there was fresh thought given to a new architecture to extend the analog IC technology by using heterogeneous uh, materials, you could say, or heterogeneous, you know, ICs where in one CMOS technology, the readout IC could be built as an analog IC and in a different technology, a digital companion ASIC could be built. And because we were using two chip architecture and we were removing a substantial amount of power from the analog readout IC and putting that into the companion ASIC chip, we could further improve the technology and get to performance levels that were far beyond what a monolithic digital CMOS readout IC could do. So I was talking about the James Webb Space Telescope earlier, you know, that's being, uh, that's about to launch. So the Hawaii uh, readout ICs that have been used for the three bands, three instruments in, uh, in that uh, telescope, they're also using the sidecar ASIC developed by Teledyne uh, as a companion chip that gives it a great performance boost in terms of reducing the power of the system substantially as well as also uh, improving the noise performance you know of uh, this overall system but eventually you know there could be so much done when the uh, analog chip was substantially removed from the asic in terms of you know the analog chip needing to do raster scan out of a few analog ports out those few ports have become 64 or 128 now over time in the latest and greatest readout ICs. But 
it's still not a highly parallel interface. And to address that problem, the latest research has been in what are known as DROICs, where these digital readout ICs now have in pixel digitization, often in a separate chip than the front end analog ROIC chip. And because there are two different chips or multiple chips being stacked to build these readout ICs, one can achieve very high performance because we can have very dense digital technology along with a high performance older generation CMOS analog technology residing together in this ROIC. And uh, using that 8 micron, 10 micron, 12 micron infrared the readout pixels are being designed with extremely high dynamic range, like the one we were talking about earlier, where you could get to a billion electron kind of sensing capacity within these small pixels. So that's the you know, latest and greatest in terms of research and the newest generation of how, what these readout ICs are doing. Now let's look into you know uh, a bit more detail about you know what these architectures look like. So if you look at the Xenix architecture they published in 2008, this was like the architecture being followed, not just by that European group, but since 1990s by most um, American groups, um, mostly around here um, from you know, our Ventura County through Santa Barbara. You know, most of these uh, ROICs were developed. And these involved a front-end circuit that uh, bonded to a detector often of the form of a capacitive trans impedance amplifier like shown over here, or a direct, direct injection, which is a common gate circuit, or a buffer direct injection that's like a regulated common gate circuit, or a source follower, which is a, a common drain kind of um, architecture. So, um, so those were the typical input circuits that were in the pixel, and eventually once the photocurrent was integrated, you know, it was sampled on a capacitor, and then a buffer amplifier helped with the raster scan uh, to read out this over an analog port. Eventually, you know, this gave way to um, digital readouts like the one we published back in 2005. This was a um, 4K by 4K format sensor that had the raster scan, you know, uh, readout in analog form into a column array where we could, you know, transfer a row of integrated charge, um, you know, charge to voltage converted voltage into this uh, row buffer and eventually scan that into a bunch of uh, multiple uh, pipeline A to D converters and digitize them at very high speed and then serialize and send them over these high speed, low voltage differential signaling LVDS interfaces, which eventually became higher speed CML interfaces. So that became the prevalent architecture uh, back then. Eventually, um, that um, got replaced by ASICs, where the analog readout, you know, could massively parallelly output its data into an ASIC. So here's, you know, the architecture of the sidecar ASIC that we we're talking about that had 36 channels. And eventually, newer ASICs have been developed, like we've been developing uh, recently, the Acadia ASIC for the Roman Space Telescope, which is the next major NASA mission. Um, and this ASIC has now 40 channels of 16-bit A to D converters that all digitize, you know, um, at up to a mega sample per second, you know, readout uh, rates, but typically 250 kilo samples per second. But they have near perfect 16-bit performance. And then other higher speed ASICs like this one developed for JPL and other applications uh, that, you know, where digitization can be done at 20 mega sample per second in a massively parallel format. All these are in the published in various SPIE conferences that have given references over here if you're interested in these ASIC technologies. So, you know, those have been um, some of the recent areas of advancement. Now, currently I mentioned that we're going towards high dynamic range architectures. And these architectures, you know, were initially developed at MIT at MIT Lincoln Lab and uh, now being developed at various U.S. aerospace uh, companies. But since most of our research over here onshore is not published, I'm pointing to a Chinese paper recently that was published in IEEE SCAS 2020, 
that is showing uh, the kind of architecture that allows us to have very high dynamic range. So in this case, what uh, they're doing is they're coupling a detector with a through a direct injection input circuit, which is a common gate circuit, so that we have a good transduction of the current onto an integration capacitor. And as we integrate the signal up on this capacitor, we eventually the voltage you know, would cross a preset threshold and this comparator would fire. And when it fires, it counts on a counter how many times it's firing and it goes back and resets this capacitor through this delta modulation feedback loop. And by doing so, it can uh, integrate again on the capacitor within your integration period and fire again and keep on counting. And the depth of this counter effectively is increasing your dynamic range by allowing this capacitor to be multiplied by n, a factor of n, but the n is like uh, equal to 2 raised to power m, where you know m is the bit depth of this uh, counter over here. So effectively what we're doing is we're reading out a digital count, which is known as the overflow count out of this kind of a pixel, as well as the residual uh, value, that's an analog value, that can be later digitized in the column or, or within the pixel itself. So by combining the overflow count and the residue, we can improve the dynamic range substantially and, and more than 20 bit type of dynamic range is uh, being demonstrated these days using these kind of advanced readout integrated circuits. There were uh, some similar advanced circuits developed early on for high energy particle detection applications. Like for example, at, at Berkeley, we had published back in late 90s, uh, this uh, kind of readout that instead of sensing a input current sensed a charge deposited by a charged particle in a particle collider experiment. And these readouts they had, instead of an integrator, a charge sensitive amplifier which is basically a band pass filter that did charge to voltage conversion and we thresholded on the signal level. And if the signal was crossing the threshold, this pixel would be autonomously read out. This kind of a readout is called a synchronous readout architecture. And this is another area of research that has become uh, very prevalent these days to move away from a frame readout to a synchronous readout that reads out an event of interest that highly compresses the amount of data that the backend processing has to deal with. This kind of asynchronous readout is often used in LiDAR applications uh, these days or is attempted to be used in LiDAR applications. So, you know, the LiDAR readouts are slightly different than uh, the integrating readouts that we talked about. And there's a lot of research these days in LiDAR, not, not only for the government uh, military type of applications, but also for commercial autonomous driving, robotics, logistics management, autonomous flight like drones uh, these days. So these LiDAR readouts are you know, a category by, by themselves where instead of an integrating front end, we may have a front end that senses the time of arrival of a charge packet, which is related to uh, the echo arriving back from a laser that was fired. So these kind of readouts can be divided into a variety of um, modalities, including a simple pulse detector that detects the pulse of charge either from a standard photodiode or an avalanche photodiode. Uh, it could be a continuous uh, time kind of application where we do frequency modulation, uh, FMCW coherent detection. Uh, and this kind of capability was demonstrated by, by our team at Rockville back in 2003. Um, and there are a variety of other uh, types of you know, readouts that are being attempted these days for LiDAR applications. I wanted to include this in the type of readouts that are you know, commonly being researched these days because this has become a very hot topic. Another area that's seen a great amount of advancement are microbolometers. These, uh, instead of using photovoltaic type of detectors, 
that use a photoelectric effect to convert a photon into electron, instead use transduction of thermal energy by using the thermal em energy to change a parameter like the resistance of a bolometer, and that the resistance is sensed by biasing this bolometer with a constant voltage and then measuring the current or biasing with a constant current and then measuring the voltage. In this case, the bolometer, active bolometer, is biased with a constant voltage, and there's also a blind bolometer biased by a constant voltage because there's a great spread over here, so we want to skim off the uh, large part of the current away, uh, and then only the difference current is integrated on the capacitive trans impedance amplifier outside the pixel. So this kind of bolometer is pretty common these days, and ULIS, for example, in France is developing uh, bolometers based on this architecture, or Teledyne, uh, you know, recently is developing these kind of moduli modules on this on this architecture. Another type of readout ICs that have become of huge interest are, you know, ones coupled to colloidal quantum dots. So here's an image, you know, that we took out of a NIR optimized 4K by 3K image sensor. It was the world's first uh, HD format and beyond image sensor with very small pixel, 1.1 micron pixel, uh, doing NIR sensing. And the reason we were able to shrink the pixel size down to so, such a small level uh, half a decade ago or so was because we could use colloidal quantum dots to spun on top of the readout IC, so it did not require a micro bump. Because these micro bumps, you know, they take some room and they have a certain pitch, so it's very difficult to shrink the technology, hybrid technology down to these levels. But with quantum dots, that could be done more readily. So that's another interesting area of research uh, these days. Then there, there's high-speed imaging, you know, that's becoming more and more Interesting. So I'll try to conclude with a few areas, you know, that are uh, now uh, of great importance because of autonomous driving. So we published at, in SPIE back in 2005 a burst mode, you know, uh, readout IC that uh, you know used multi-sampling inside the pixel, where you could take each sample separated only by 180 nanoseconds. So we could run multi-mega frame per second an imager to image very, very high speed events. But unfortunately, you can fit only a certain amount of memory in a pixel, otherwise the pixel really blows up to an unmanageable level. We wanted to build a 720 by 720 format imager initially and eventually a megapixel format. So when we were researching in the initial modality, we fit just three samples in the pixel and eventually we researched to put in the more, but there's a limit to how many can fit within a pixel. So to overcome that, now low latency event-driven readouts are being developed that are biologically inspired. And here's a event-driven readout architecture shown that is mimicking our optical, biological uh, in the sensor architecture from our photoreceptors in the eye to bipolar cells and eventually on-off ganglions. So what this kind of sensor does is logarithmically compresses the input signal and then does delta modulation to look at temporal contrast, look at what's changing in the scene, and then thresholds on the temporal contrast and only reads out events on and off events over here where the contrast is going up or contrast is going down and does not read out redundant information where the scene is static. This is very similar to how our human eye or human brain perceives many scenes. So over here, we have taken um, locally uh, with a mid-wave IR camera an image in our local streets over here in Westlake Village. So this is a regular image, and what we have done is we have passed uh, this video through a neuromorphic algorithm that extracts the differences between uh, scenes to look at the co temporal contrast, and we are adjusting the various parameters associated with the temporal contrast, and we derive the three different images that have different amount of sensitivity, but different amount of false alarm and noise levels also. So the most sensitive image is shown in the middle, but it's hard to see over here, but you see a lot of flickering other pixels that show false alarm, but it also shows just the moving objects and very little else over here in the scene. 
And over here, we dialed down the false alarm, but at the same time, the sensitivity is left, uh, lost, and we're seeing a little, you know, much less amount of pixels firing from motion. At the bottom, we have a good compromise where we have almost no false alarm, but we are extracting some edges of the moving objects. So these kind of temporal contrast uh, sensing readout ICs are a hot topic of research these days, and they're becoming more and more common. I'll skip over some slides, you know, just in the interest of time, trying to conclude now that we've seen, you know, what the hot areas of re current research are, where we have gotten there from. What does the future of this technology hold? So, yes, we do want larger imagers and we want more pixels. So instead of with brute force, you know, stacking more pixels on a larger and larger chip or making the pixels smaller and smaller to a level that they can't hold much charge, more advanced 3D packaging techniques are being invented. These involve bonding one type of, you know, IC onto an interposer where we can pretty much gaplessly tile these tiles into a much larger array. Also, smaller pixels, you know, is an area of research. And eventually the limit of how small you can go is defined by the diffraction limit of the light, you know, that is incident on it. So the longer the wavelength of light we're looking at, the bigger the blur spot because of diffraction limit, because of the Rayleigh's diffraction criteria. So um, in shortwave infrared, you know, right now we have achieved three micron uh, size pixels in midwave five and long wave 10. These can go further down as the optics is being improved and the blur spots are decreasing to one to two microns in sphere, two to four in midwave, and four to eight, eight microns in long wave. So that's, you know, a area of research and eventually uh, putting multiple color into a single pixel and making these pixels a bit smaller, you know, is an area of research for the next five to 10 years. So making larger images, much smaller pixels that are effectively diffraction limited is, you know, important. But in addition to that, being able to found, count every photon is another important area of research. Right now, scientific imager technology with exotic high capacitance detectors like a mercury cadmium telluride or indium antimonide have been able to achieve a few electrons of noise with, with very large formats. But eventually, um, people want to be able to see every photon. And for that, single photon avalanche phot photodiodes or other form of linear mode APDs are being invented. And consequently, the readout ICs for those kind of sensors are being invented that will be able to count every photon that's incident on the detector. Current um, pre-2020, most of the readout ICs were non-high dynamic range, and now high dynamic range is becoming common. Over the next decade, I feel that almost all the ICs will be high dynamic range with the delta modulation type of architectures that I talked about earlier so that they can, they can achieve background limited imager performance even for scenes or even for flux levels that are very high. In addition to that, the readout ICs are getting smart. Initially, they're getting adaptive based on some heuristics or other adaptive circuitry. We're working on a program called Reimagine Program from DARPA that is building adaptive technology uh, that would really change the game in uh, the ways, you know, that we haven't seen for the last decade or two. Um, but these are getting even smarter where neural net nets are being integrated into these image sensors now. And this image sensor will not be able to only uh, sense images or improve the image quality, but they'll be able to provide information out of these image sensors. Currently, the image sensors are mostly frame readout type, but because the amount of data is increasing with the frame rates and the number of pixels being packed, over the next decade, we'll have great amount of data decimation type of uh, formats. So the neuromorphic, type of sensors that we just talked about, they will become more and more prevalent. So mostly they will become asynchronous where instead of on a frame clock, you read out a frame, 
the image sensor will output information when there's relevant information to be output. And right now, mostly their companion readout A6 that post process the information, either digitize or process to improve the image quality. But over the next decade, more and more capability is being integrated into these um, ASICs, and eventually these ASICs are being stacked in this decade with the image sensors itself, so that these ASICs can have neuromorphic computing or neural net built on them, in within them, like uh, CNNs within the ASICs, and have a massively parallel interface to the image sensor, a per-pixel interface to the image sensors through this 3D stacking technology, so that autonomous action can be taken by the sensor itself. Rather than outputting a piece of information saying that here's an intruder, it would be able to detect, identify, classify, and even take a appropriate action by itself. So in conclusion, you know, we've come a long way. We started developing even before my time, because my time started in 1990s, researching this area with some very simple CCD de detectors, eventually improving the performance so that we were background limited image of performance, got the pixel size shrunk, made the arrays larger and larger, to now, where beyond 2021, we are seeing amazingly large formats that, are, that have you know, a spatial resolution better than the human eye, we are using interposers, butting, various technologies to make such large imagers very cost effective. 3D ICs are becoming common, so imagers are being stacked to improve their performance. High dynamic range, you know, is being worked on so that we can have amazing dynamic range. We can have read noise and single electrons, and while we can still simultaneously integrate a billion electrons in a pixel. And we're going to diffraction limited pixel sizes. These pixel sizes are amazingly small. The cell phones are going to come out in commercial, you know, sensing with half micron pixel sizes. And in the IR world, you know, a couple of micron pixel sizes are starting to become available. Now the sensors are, uh, though, although they've beaten most of the physical limits, they're getting into avalanche photodiodes to count every photon. They're becoming adaptive and starting to do information processing on board. So with that, you know, I would like to conclude this talk and uh, take any questions. All right, thank you. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and do or enable the unmuting of folks. Um, and there all, are also a couple questions that people typed in that I will go ahead and... Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> Stand by just a second here. This always takes me a moment. <coughs> All right. Uh, first question. Uh, this is from uh, Mohammed. Uh, he said that IR detectors exhibit one over F noise in their output. Is the detector material the source of the noise or the ROIC assembly? That's a great question. Uh, depends on the detector, depends on the application. Uh, so there are detectors that have poor 1 over F noise and there are detectors that have very good 1 over F noise right now. There are ROICs which are 1 over F noise limited and there are ones that are not. So just to give you an example, if you have a long wavelength cutoff material that's very narrow band gap, Often that that kind of detector is made with a ternary device uh, like mercury oh, yeah. and telluride, um, and those kind of materials they are very prone to any lattice uh, defects, you know, causing a noise to show up, and they do have um, substantial one over F noise. They also have very low impedance in the detector, and if a ROIC circuit is coupled to a very low impedance detector, then that noise amplifies. So not only do they have low one over F noise, but we can't suppress it easily. Uh, the uh, second thing I'd like to say is there's noise beyond one over F. There's one over F squared noise, you know, popcorn type of noise or uh, random telegraph signal noise. 
that's prevalent in these uh, imagers. In, in images, have, everything is statistical, have, right? We have a lot of pixels in an image sensor. So uh, because of that, there will always be some pixels that exhibit um, RDN type of noise. So that is also an area of concern and how to overcome that. You know, there's a lot of research going on in that and how to suppress that, especially as we getting into smart sensors. The problem with these is even greater because if there is a greatly noisy pixel, it may look like a signal that you're trying to detect and it may overwhelm your sensor. So a few noisy pixels can totally choke your uh, bandwidth and the asynchronous sensor. So, you know, uh, that's some. That's a good question because that's a great area of research right now. All right, thanks. Um, next question from Michael. Uh, how advanced is Chinese technology compared to U.S. technology? <laughs> that's an <laughs> interesting question. I, I would say, uh, I mean, I'll try to answer that with a straight face. Uh, I would say uh, they're behind. Uh, they are trying to catch up. Uh, there's a lot of at least what we can see from the outside, right? Because we are reading publication. We don't know really what's going on really in China. Yeah. But we've seen increased publication activity. I track uh, publications in certain V.IC image sensor domain, and you know we try to keep track of all the publications coming out. Around mid-2010s, Chinese publications started surpassing the amount of American publications out there. And more recently, around 2020, Chinese publications have, uh, in any given area of image sensors, has exceeded the rest of the world combined. So there's a lot of activity over there for sure, but uh, we see that the technology that they're working on, at least publishing, is stuff that we worked on a while back. All right, thank you. Uh, next question from William. Uh, has there been a companion generational evolution in fabrication technologies that facilitated the generational changes in sensors? Sorry, I couldn't hear that question very well. Uh, sorry about that. Um, has there been a companion generational evolution in fabrication technology uh, that facilitated the generation changes in sensors? Absolutely. Uh, that that is the one of the prime reasons we were able to improve these sensors. So I can tell you when I started working on image sensors back in mid uh, 1990s in graduate school. At that time, we were primarily using for good analog performance one micron to 0.8 micron CMOS processes. In the scientific uh, sensor community, the technology went to quarter micron to 0.18 in the early 2000s. Right now, it's not very un not uncommon to be using, you know, deep submicron technology like 45 nanometers or 65 nanometers, 40 nanometers, even down to that. 90 nanometers become very very common. So, because this technology is shrinking, you know, it's helping us make better sensors, but <laughs> One thing you know that you could say is that all these improved architectures could still be done in older technologies in a larger pixel format, a larger pixel size. So you know what you can do in 90 nanometers, less than 10 micron pixel, you could probably do in 180 nanometers and 20 micron pixel. So so there is improvement in technology that's facilitated the advancements, but there's also a lot of creativity within electronics engineering community. That's been advancing the, uh, uh, the the sensors too. Thanks. Uh, a question from uh, Shantanu: What is the quanta image sensor architecture based on? Uh, apparently, photon number resolving in CMOS at room temperature. <clears throat> So there are a few uh, competing technologies these days trying to do single photon resolving at room temperature uh, in silicon. Uh, one of them is based on our traditional uh, readout technology using a source follower, you know, per pixel readout using paint photodiodes, but it is uh, trying to shrink the noise 
four <laughs> polymer. Um, coordinated double sampling has been used for a while, so uh, the uh, reset noise has been taken out. But there's still the read noise from the pixel source follower that's you know uh, have been dominating. So there are improved buried channel devices being built and other advanced devices to reduce that noise to a level that's about a third of electron read noise. And once you get into a third of electron read noise, you could say you start having a decent signal to noise ratio when you detect a single photon that converts into a single electron. So that's your traditional technology. Another technology is SPAD, uh, single photon avalanche um, you know, diode, where um, the detector itself has a high electric field gain region. So when you detect a, a photon and you convert it into electron hole pair, the electron is accelerated through this gain region where it causes an avalanche and you know creates more electrons, you know, frees more electrons from the lattice and creates a large current spike. And with that, you know, now we can overcome the readout noise and we can detect uh, faint signals like single uh, photons. So that technology is greatly being improved right now. And then the, there's a third technology, you know, um, that is involving gain, but with different mechanism like uh, skipper CCDs in pixels or uh, just very, very high gain uh, pixels like the jots being uh, developed right, right now, or nano jots, where the pixel is divided into quantized single charge buckets. So a pixel, if you want it to be able to integrate a 1024 electrons, like a 10 bit type of you know, response, it will be divided into uh, you know, 1024 single buckets and each bucket will be sensitive to a single electron. So uh, this is basically a very, very high gain pixel uh, that's being designed in Pasadena or, or nearby where, uh, you know, uh, where you can do uh, single photon counting using a different mechanism. So they're, they're about, you know, if I were to count there probably half a dozen different technologies trying to achieve that. The single photon avalanche photodiode, uh, the SPAD is like, you know, the technology that most people are pursuing at this time. All right, thanks. A um, uh, question from uh, Kadri. I, I apologize if I'm pronouncing any names incorrectly, by the way. Uh, can you comment on CMOS imagers only versus LIDAR for autonomous driving applications if cost was not a factor? So, um, if cost was not a factor, I'm trying to understand the question. Then, uh, are, then could lidar um, sensor be prevalent? Uh, uh, I, I guess I, I, I guess the question would be which which is which is better if cost was not a factor. Oh, okay, uh, got it. Yeah, so there's this uh, battle going on between Elon Musk and uh, various other people. Where, where Elon's popularized the notion that you know lidar is useless, um, it's uh, a crutch at, at the best. Is I think the statement he made, uh, saying that computational imaging is the way to go, and Tesla's use only uh, uh, CMOS visible sensors and use computation uh, like motion flow analysis to figure out where you know there are obstructions. So I, I believe you know that. There are great advancements being done there. Intel has done a lot of work in that field. Um, so computational imaging is there to stay. Um, and CMOS sensor will get smarter and smarter. But at the same time, LiDAR does offer depth sensing. And it does allow you to be able to, uh, you know, see certain obstructions that are not easily seen by computation. And computation right now, is becoming, you know, uh, very extreme in the sense of amount of computation required, uh, you know, is making the power blow up in these sensors. So I think the LiDAR will keep on reducing in cost. Right now it's very expensive, but LiDAR will be an additional modality to CMOS. I don't think there will be one or the other, but LiDAR will augment to depth sensing what the computational imaging is trying to do with, with CMOS. All right. Um, question from uh, AC: Are there any any uh, imaging applications or any advantages of with use of superconducting detectors? I believe uh, there's interest in that. 
I'm not personally an expert on that, so I won't uh, hazard a comment, but there is um, there is work going on. I've seen some work going on, but I don't know most recently uh, what the level of advancement there is. Right. Uh, question from uh, Shantar Tanu again. Uh, are commercial applications, e.g. autonomous driving using GM APD sensors? If they use LIDAR, do you know? Right, so the SPAD that I'm mentioning um, is a, another acronym for GMAPD, Geiger mode avalanche photodiode or single photon uh, avalanche diode. Uh, they're synonymous. So, um, so th that technology is being pursued for um, self-driving cars extensively, but uh, it is not at the level right now you know, I feel, especially in large array formats in flash LIDAR, where um, it's deployed um, because of various reasons, including performance and cost. But I think it's the most promising technology going forward. Right now, linear mode, um, you know, avalanche photodiodes and simple pin diodes, you know, are most commonly being used in active systems that are out there. Okay. Uh, a question from uh, Cadre. Uh, can you comment on the status of CMOS imagers in night vision goggles? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Uh, so, night vision goggles, um, they traditionally have been based on image intensifier tubes that use microchannel plates. And these have gotten to sensitivity level, witty levels that are hard to beat. I mean, if you just look at the lux levels of a scene, like a dark day is, you know, like a hundred thousand lux or indoors. Um, and you know, uh, these, if you go to the night vision um, application, they're talking about ten to hundred micro lux, and, and you know, the DARPA type of research being done even beyond, but. Uh, the typical application is 10 to 100 micro lux. So you can see how uh, dark that is. That's a million times darker than uh, a reasonably dark room. Uh, so microchannel plates, you know, they allow you uh, through the avalanche process to convert a single photon into a shower of electrons that impinge on either um, um, a phosphor or another uh, imager. And they have this gain, you know, that uh, is hard to beat. So CMOS sensors, you know, uh, trying to beat uh, microchannel plates, what they try to do is invent EBAPS technology. Intervac is a primary company you know, that's pursuing that. It's called electronically bombarded active pixel sensor where you uh, have a tube up front, you accelerate your, uh, you know, photoelectron, you don't avalanche it, you just give it imparted enough energy. And then when that electron hits the crystal of silicon, it'll create an avalanche within the silicon CMOS chip itself. So that was the first generation attempt of a CMOS IC uh, trying to uh, you know, beat microchannel plates in image intensifier tubes. But it still requires a intensifier in the form of you know, something that imparts a lot of energy to the electron. So now more recently, um, there's all solid state research going on trying to replace this tube with just a simple CMOS sensor. But the best commercial product that's out there right now is at a millilux level. So that's, you know, 10 to 100x poorer than, uh, than what can be done with some gain. Avalanche photodiodes could get you there, right? Um, current research uh, is being done to reduce the noise of those millilux without using avalanche photodiodes to get to the 100 micro lux or beyond uh, lower levels. But I think uh, the way to go may be some form of solid state gain like uh, GM APD or, or in linear mode APD within the pixel. All right, thanks. Uh, not sure you can answer this question, but I'll, I will ask, from, it's from Michael. Um, is there significant investment in technology that is classified? <laughs> Yes. All right. <laughs> Thank you. That information is classified. Yeah, I, I, 
I kind of I kind of figure that that, that that was just a yes or no question, and and you wouldn't be able to go into any details. So uh, if if you even knew them, but um, it is a good question. It's just, it's a valid question. Just uh, the answer is yes. All right. <laughs> uh, question from Muhammad. Um, uh, source of one over f noise in the system. Non <clears throat> Excuse me. Let me try that again. A source of one hour of ref noise in the system nonlinearity. Does the optical non non nonlinearity of MCTs or the high gains used in ROIC contribute to one hour of ref noise? I could not fully grasp that question. If you ever have to repeat it, I tripped over it. Yes. Uh, does the optical nonlinearity of MCT or the high gains used in ROIC contribute most to the NO, to the one over F noise. I don't think you should think of um, the high gain uh, contributing to the one over F noise. I mean, I wouldn't think of it that way. Yes, you need to gain up the signal, so um, you need a circuit there, and, and if you have MOSFETs, you will get some one over F noise. Uh, but uh, there is one over F noise in both MCT detectors, if you specifically talk about it, but that's not the only kind of detector. Even silicon detectors have one over F noise. And uh, there's one over F noise in the readout IC. And both interact with each other. So the input circuit, uh, you can think of the front end amplifier, for example. If it had one over F noise and the detector has no impedance, then that one over F noise gets amplified by the detector, um, you know, having low impedance because that voltage over small resistance will create a large noise current. And, you know, if the detector has high one over F noise, then, you know, that itself is a problem because, you know, uh, because then you need to develop some techniques in readout ICs to try to correlate and cancel that out. So, you know, both of them have one over F noise and the impedances of both the readout IC and the detector play with each other to amplify each other's one over F noise. All right, thanks. Uh, that's all the tech questions. I will remind folks that you can uh, you can unmute as well and, and ask questions if you'd like. So, since I've gone through all the tech ones, uh, anybody want to speak up? Uh, don't be shy. Yep. Hey, Atul, how are you? This is Amit. Hi, Amit. Yeah, okay. so <laughs> I'm doing well. So uh, one thing uh, I was wondering, uh, you didn't mention about uh, the whole global shutter uh, with charge domain global shutter and what improvements it has had in machine vision and pretty much most stuff. And then the other thing I want to uh, your uh, uh, sense on this whole spin on the sphere thing, which is the multiple quantum dots, which you mentioned. I mean, what kind of uh, do you think in the next few years the whole world will get filled with sphere de detectors? I mean, just, just curious. <laughs> uh, good, good question. So, um, let me take the second one first and I'll answer the first one. So, mm -hmm. multiple quantum dots or so, there's a lot of promise in this technology, right? Because it's so inexpensive and you don't need to um, have a different detector material you can pretty much grow this on top of your readout ic but the problem with um, quantum dots are that you know typically they're not broadband in terms of spectral bandwidth they're fairly narrow band so they find limited use um, one great application could be for you know, face ID in a cell phone, for example, where uh, there's a pixel that's uh, projecting a dot pattern, you know, a grid pattern on the face, and then there's a sensor that needs to sense it, and you know, there's a specific laser wavelength that you need to sense. Um, uh, so it's a very you know, small spectral band, and um, at the same time, you know, um, you uh, want this to be low cost you know, technology and you want to push this wavelength way beyond what human eye can see. So, you know, you want to be close to the silicon band gap or near IR, so quantum dots may, you know, may help. So there are um, applications being explored, but I, I would say personally feel 
So the technology is not mature to compete with any mainstream CMOS image sensor in terms of you know noise performance. Q is better in certain bands, like when you get very close to the silicon cutoff or beyond. But uh, they are also they're better detector materials like in gas and or so you know that that have much better performance than these. So TBD, I am not fully sold that it will take over the world. And second uh, part is the global shutter. Yeah, I, I left that out because the biggest battle in uh, rolling line shutter and global shutter was in non-scientific community in the uh, standard image sensors that I'm totally trying to avoid in this talk because that's itself a big topic. You know, the mobile phone sensors and digital still cameras and what Trent does with you know um, image sensors for motion video. Uh, so there, um, there, there's you know a tra transition from rolling line shutter to global shutter, and the big push has been in how do we get the same noise performance that we had with correlated double sampling, with rolling line shutter in uh, with global shutter pixels while keeping the pixels small and while having great shutter rejection ratio. So those are topics in themselves. In the scientific community, most of the sensors were always global shutter. Because you know uh, the uh, the readout IC was separated from the detector material, except in astronomy where it was not required. Most of them were already to start with global shutter. True. Thanks. All right. Thank you. Uh, another question from uh, AC: Are there any applications left for CCD detectors? Yes, uh, there are uh, some applications left. CCDs are very efficient at summing signal uh, by their very nature because they're they're moving charge, so you can sum charge easily. So still um, in uh, space applications where push broom scanners are used, uh, time domain integration, like TDI type of uh, sensors are still predominantly using CCDs, but the CCD processes are gone. There are only a couple of fabs left in the world that are make, making or manufacturing CCDs. So the CCDs have moved on to CMOS processes. So people are trying to develop CCDs. Uh, you know, in Stanford, there was a lot of research uh, back in early 2000s, mid 2000s, to develop CCDs in CMOS processes, processes. And now it's become common and there are commercial products available, for example, from Teledyne Dalsa that are CCD in CMOS. Uh, you know, a North American product, a offshore product is from Gpixel, you know, in, in China. They're also doing CCD and CMOS. They're both using the same fab, actually, but uh, but they both have now uh, these kind of products that do TDI very efficiently in a CMOS chip using CCDs. Thank you. So um, it's after 8.30, which is our uh, announced end time. So, uh, Sudan, do you have any uh, final comments before we uh, before we sign off? Uh, thank you. It's a great presentation. Uh, you could see that there are a lot of questions. Uh, uh, still, uh, uh, people want to ask more questions. They can send you an email. You have your email address in, uh, I think, in the first page. Uh, they can talk to you directly. Um, thank you for the presentation. It's a great presentation. A lot of information. Thank you. Sir. All right. Uh, I don't see any uh, type questions either. So at that point, uh, I'll go ahead and close it. Uh, thank you very much. And thank you, everybody who attended. Thank you all. Thank you. Bye. Bye.